is still running. Yep, it's, is it I think it's running. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and do it then? We'll adjust. 612 Social Studies Secondary, October 20th, afternoon. Just Just hit stop and then down to there's the link.
When this exercise is over, I assume we're going to have to eventually get back to our course level expectations and ask what do we like, what do we not like about the current seniors, right? So there's this is my 
teachers originally in the nature that generate a lesson option for their committees of teachers that were all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, when Mary said earlier today, uh, there are two things that we need to focus on. Remember, there were five things that she listed, and then there were, there were two things. What exactly was that? Uh, we never really had that conversation with Mary before. I think she was. Yes. And then a curriculum that a school district might make. Uh -huh. And then the last thing I am worried about the right. time that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So we're only charged with the standard. Okay. Um, the curricular frameworks and all of that is like the system. We don't have to do yeah. that. Okay. She was Students able to do when they do high school. Right. Right. 
that offered automatically there. So that these are a, there's a page for each of the kind of items we identified in the work earlier. But there's also another idea because I don't think we didn't have an exhaustive list. So if it fits with one of those, great. If not, we've got like that other, you know. Yeah. And I, I kind of just mentioned if you were careful, uh, make sure you reference which source your good ideas are.
that was taken. And so I just made sure that the number was in the email. Did you have any, did you have any idea of email address? I don't care. Well, we know that. Because you've got to differentiate between the same special education and non special education as well. And they have to look at that. They have to look at your state percent rate form. But in all testing, is that what the reading is? I think that's not. So they can put that down. So one would let that slide. The person has to say, I'm allowed to do that. That needs to be done.
how it looks to be friendly uh, to that. It could be a way to really kind of articulate with distinct levels um, within those fields. And even if six through eight had that kind of disciplinary way of thinking about social studies, this would be the art of general economics. All of that was covered all across um, at least those grade levels, which again sets up nicely when you do um, separate them at the high school level and then we discuss whether we want to get there or not. Um, but I thought those, those you know, five standards were really impressive with that. I'd like to have a funny standards, the Houston standard you were mentioning. Um, the uh, analysis skills were something that we're also going to aspire to, and the standards are kind of fed back into that. And that's why I really like how California set that up. And I feel like there's a lot of the C3 that we can kind of um, think about, you know, the, the, at least the Ohio standards, um, where they set up the, the content standards of history was specific content that you had to kind of address. Um, but it gave districts, it was that felt a lot of latitude in terms of how they interpreted that particular um, historical strand, that particular content strand. And then government, geography, um, and economics were basically about the skills within the discipline. And I feel like there's a lot of the C3, especially the disciplinary strand of C3, that we can kind of incorporate and kind of merge and blend um, some of that C3 into those spaces. Um, Process so I, I thought they were really helpful. Um, kind of there are ways that we can think we can merge these things nicely with what we have, but also with something that we think on our question.
they don't want to learn about that stuff. I don't want to learn. That's where we get a lot most of the arguments about who to be included, who to be not included. Uh, really do not like that idea. Uh, that gives districts the freedom to teach what other examples uh, people that they want. Uh, but I feel like we need a little bit more specific uh, history to that we can do. Um, not as not as detailed as any of those. Maybe um, if you notice Ohio when it gets into uh, the high school, it has content statements like the United States and the Soviet Union were all superpowers and competed for both influence. This is some page 35. That's a pretty it's specific, but it doesn't tell you might need to learn grow the child on a crucial show. Should be 
able to apply it in lots of historical contexts. So I was drawn to that kind of language that I thought was a lot more clear than our current document. You know, our document might say, well, I get to understand economic decision making, is sort of the heading that that was pulled from, but this is, is really an actual task that a student might do. So I think a lot of you felt like the um, formatting that is integrating and not pulling those inquiries apart um, it makes it more central, using really carefully chosen language, some of which I, I found I didn't even notice in the written out. So I thought that um, some of that would make our discussion in terms of content um, a little bit easier. Um, you know, I felt that um, some in Massachusetts um, and California were very, very content specific, um, you know, probably more specific than where you were, but I do think you need some content in there, whereas in the C3 is content, there is no specific historical content. So I think I just felt like there's a lot of really good sources, and that our current document really is kind of already kind of hitting the you have an inquiry in your document so I was envisioning a way to really sort of just make that a little more clear and, and allow the learning to be so that teachers can use it more effectively um, when they're writing curriculum. So. I thought I thought that Massachusetts didn't leave very much room for um, individual school districts and populations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did look, I saw California briefly, it was more specific, I think, but I might be misremembering it. Um, but I kind of felt like there was a, we have a continuum from really, really content without a lot of skill, or all the way over to the other end, all skill, no content. I think my preference would be a little too far. And I, I liked, as many people said, I like people hiring the format. I think they did both. The idea of thinking classrooms, thinking students within the, the context of the course in which it was addressing you know, K through 12, so that you know, like Ohio's document K through 8, I really like the fact that it was focusing on multiple lenses and the different type of thinking disciplinary tools that exist within those contexts. Um, I think that was was very appealing and where kids need to be and listening to like Larry earlier and saying that you know kids can come in who can evaluate sources and we can create an argument. We can give them anything. And if they know how to break apart and think and, and, and recreate some type of action or communication, then you're well served. And so I too was was drawn to that. I did find that in the Ohio documents and the C3 in particular, with the C3 what I liked is the multiple examples of that process of the whole inquiry arc where you're really looking at gathering multiple sources and looking at multiple perspectives and then looking at it through the multiple lenses of a historian, a geographer, an economist, um, a political scientist, um, before even going any further, that you're really, whether it be a particular time period like the Cold War or if it was, you know, a particular global issue in world history that you were looking at all those lenses. Um, the biggest piece though that I think is huge is the C3 framework, I think really pulled it out, and California did a little bit too, was that teaching action. Not just leaving it there, not just about the thinking and breaking apart, but now how you be active as a citizen, whether it be of the United States, in the United States, but even more in a global community, if it's something that's a geographic problem or an environmental problem or things like that. So really, Ohio and Seabreeze too. I need to stop that. Okay, so I have a question because it's been going so far that it's been all the documents that they do that. Um, I did like in New York the way that they looked at the patterns and presented the issues and problems and then uh, like the comparisons way um, I think the C3 framework really addresses what Judy brought up earlier about teaching our children with language needs and to know what's a valid source, what's not a valid source. I really like how that worked. Um, and I also thought that Missouri colleges are expectations of independent freshmen. 
might be a good place to go back periodically and check and make sure that we're, we're hitting those points as well. Or are there any questions? So you like what the CP was in that slide? Um, I like the focus on skills, reasoning, um, recognizing that with sources of question, higher level of skills.
whether this is a true story or not, based upon which source I looked at. So that one really caught my attention. Page 40 of the California uh, document. Yeah, historical research evidence in 2020. And one other piece I liked was the CR C3 in Jessica Young. So that is taking informed action. Because we talked about that earlier in the day about the Clark County Department of Students taking informed action. That is a nice way for. K through 12 to get to the CMA. And then you can just take them there. Mm -hmm. C3 things. Closing my screen. Okay. Um, I'm, look, I'm looking at all this through the lens of a school administrator, so you can scorn me or not, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's why I say that. Um, I'm kind of entrenched in this whole Marzano guaranteed bio, bio curriculum stuff that we've all heard about. And basically, that is teachers must have adequate time to teach and students must have adequate time to learn. And the curriculum that is uh, taught is the curriculum that's assessed. So I say all of that to make a case for why I like the Massachusetts framework. Because it's very easy uh, to, as, as you're holding people accountable for teaching what is prescribed, you can very, very easily figure out that these things are mentioned in the curriculum, if these things are included in PC guides, if these things are included in lesson plans. And I'm thinking, if I'm a teacher, I would like to have that level of specificity. In other words, it says right here under the Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, summarize the critical developments leading to the Civil War. And then they include 10 different things there. Well, if I'm a teacher, especially if I'm a beginning teacher, and I'm working out there in a small school district where I may be the only social studies teacher around, this kind of direction would be very helpful for me. Because by golly, I'm going to make sure I teach the Compromise of 1850. Because hopefully that is going to be aligned to the assessment eventually. And I don't want to shortchange my kids by not covering that. So, uh, and I also like this because it, um, it, it specifies the seminal primary documents for students to read with regards to those topics. And then it also gives documents to consider. I think that's a great resource for teachers. And again, it's back to what I said before, if all kids in Missouri read the Gettysburg Address, they all have that common understanding, that common experience that links them to the Gettysburg Address and all that's associated with that. So I really like that. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. Some people may say, well, it's too specific and it doesn't give teachers freedom. I think it allows for Done through instruction to ensure that these things are covered. Anyway, that's my take on that. I also like so Ohio. Huh? Oh, yeah, we had a fascinating conversation. It's a sidebar. But it's yeah, it, it's interesting to me that this is from Massachusetts. So the similar documents are all by union. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are no similar documents from the Confederate side. Oh, interesting. Which gets to another question. You know, who are our historians and what perspective they bring in our textbooks and our resources? And uh, what are we doing in Missouri about that as well? Well, but it, it's to your point about popular Think that's critical, and I think we're missing that. 
in our state. I think, I think in fairness to teachers and in fairness to kids, we should say, and parents too, I'm a parent of a of three children, and I would like to know when my child leaves ninth grade uh, government or political science, we call it in our school, this is what they should be expected, this is what she should be expected to do. And then I can make an analysis based on whether I think my kid can do that or not. But I, I think we need to do a better job articulating what those things are that we want kids to really know and be able to do at the end of each course, or this is broken down by grade spans here, two by eight and 12. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are broken down by other grades. You look at the grades of the test grades, right? I would assume so, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Are you done now? Yes, I am. I see a lot of um, good things in everything. I don't think we're far off the mark, but what I really like is that you put up the word class. Um, and the reason is because we've had that discussion that you can't separate the events in history from economics. And unless you do it like what I see some of these states doing, like personal economics, but that's, that's a very limited. So, I think we have something to contribute to the national conversation on what some of the issues we bring. Um, I agree. Well, here's my one of my pet peeves about the word critical thinking. Critical thinking, the word critical has a specific meaning, but it's being, being uh, diluted to mean critical and analytical thinking. I, need, I think we need to separate those words. What we need to teach the kids how to do, and this is a conversation we had with Leslie, one of the things in writing an APA divorce is that you take yourself out of the narrative. MLA teaches you to write from your author's perspective. You can be a character in the story, it can be about you. But that's not how you should be making objective decisions and analyzing the data. You don't shoot for what I want the data to say. You say, let me let me remove myself from here. Do the observations, analyze the data, and then I can make comments about them. I've got graduate students who don't know how to do that because they're always writing, putting themselves as a story. What if we're going to be a discipline of history or of political science, we have to be able to remove ourselves from it. And do the observations, not with a good or a bad, but just what is. And then come to an understanding of how what is affected the quality of life of the people we're, we're analyzing. And then make comments about, uh, you know, that's where you can play with what your criticism is of one or the other or another system. Criticism comes way in the end after analysis. And we're not teaching that. So that's why I like the California the United States, the California, because I have a section on analysis. But I would, and I'm only using this on high level because it's the closest to what I saw in the UK. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to bring that chart back because. What is the email that kind of makes you? Good. <clears throat> this is the closest to it that I thought would be fair enough. And um, what I would love to see is some level of analysis introduced at every grade level and start writing if you were a historian for an APA in high school. And that prepares you for college, right? Um, I liked, I think what I heard Wendy say about the Massachusetts standards, and, and I have to agree, that, look, it, I'm, I'm not one to point in a numbers game, but here's how it works. Massachusetts came out number one every time because they had tests aligned to very clear standards. That's how it happened. It's not their kids are any brighter. It's that their tests were closer to what was expected. And that, that uh, confirms what you were saying. The broader you are, or the more vague you are with your language and the standards, the more you come out with questions about Texas. 
when those questions about ranching should have been about other dark. <laughs> That's what we do there. We've got ranching. Right? Had the standard been clear enough, we wouldn't have had questions. Right? So that's that's a plug for what we can do in Rockford, Massachusetts. Um, Lab California had um, yeah. Oh, the other thing about Massachusetts and California that they share was that they embedded the standard, and this is what Wendy was saying, they embedded the standard in a larger context of explanation. It wasn't like New York. I didn't even recognize New York because it was just a bunch of dots on the front page. Right? This is not helpful if I'm a first year teacher in rural areas graduating from college. This, I'm, I'm, I'm so anxious when I look at this. I don't know what to do. If I look at this, you're giving me direction. Right? So that's that's what I would love to do. Did you say California and Massachusetts? And yeah. Massachusetts? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, again, I, I think we should not ignore the work of our faculty and teachers up to 2008. I, they had something very important to tell us about college readiness, and we need to use them to let people check in. So, that said, I agree with you. There are some very interesting verbs and tools we can use in here, but they come after we decide what the point of the line is. And then we can use that. So, and I'll tell you why. Because, because of what Julie said earlier. Where people are getting, I would say, upset with social studies is that when we ask the children to take action, our, the question is, who makes a decision on what action to take? And we can't violate family values. So if we can empower the children to take action, it has to be not within the context of the school, but in the context of their larger lives. So if, I'll give you an example of what happened at MSU. Students, as a class assignment, were told in the sociology class to write a letter. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but they were told to write a letter, and they were told to have, take a specific side in the letter writing. You can ask your students to write a letter, you can't tell them which side to take. So having written a letter should have fulfilled the assignment requirement. But when the professor was clunking a student because she didn't take the side he wanted, that was the problem. She won the lawsuit. We don't need to go in our school. We need to give the students the freedom to interpret how they want to take action as long as we see them taking an activity of some kind. And that, that helps us the best reason why. So, um, oh gosh, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so. I'm glad that I had a chance to kind of observe the curriculum on the issues and the cheddar plate. This is language that's all very new to me as a parent. When I look at it, I want to say, chuck it all, give them books free, let them figure it out, make it fun. This is so busy work in my little mind. I'm sorry, small. And I know you guys see the big picture of all this, but that's kind of what comes at me sometimes when I look at a lot of these details. I'm like, oh my gosh, busy work. Um, you know, when I think of children, I have identical twins. They live differently. And they're both brilliant. They don't know it yet. The school doesn't know it yet. But they are. <laughs> I have a four year old daughter who's even more brilliant and can now organize the arts. I can do that at that age. This might get sore. My boys don't know how to put things in the drawer. Like, they're 12. Okay, so you're dealing with all these different brains, and you've got to figure out a way to get content into the child without boring them with busy work. And you want to give them a love for learning. And so I, my big concern, and you guys are the expert at implementation. Teachers are the ones who deal with these different brain types in the classroom. And so I want to put in the hands of teachers the ability to have variety in implementation if necessary. You know, some kids may not want to read a biography, even though I think they should all be reading biographies. You know, they might want, they might prefer um, to study through the arts. 
through paintings, through music, to link time periods. And I, I think it's very important that we not forget some of that whenever we're looking at history to incorporate some of the arts. Um, I think that's really important. Um, that's that's going to capture a different set of people in history. Uh, but, you know, and there's things that I liked about C3. I, I liked the economics of it. I liked how it was set up. There were things that I, I liked how they communicated in it. But there were also things I didn't like, and I'm going to take it this uh, And I don't mean this to be, um, I just think that I don't like the words who can inform action. It's very inflammatory to me. I prefer what I think we all like as participating, as a little less um, aggressive, you know, attack. I don't want it to be attack. Because I think there are very good things that we are failing to communicate today because there is that heated debate. It's just so bitter and it's awful. And I would like for our students to appreciate the American system of government again. That we kind of build that back in instead of this sort of, um, no matter, I mean, not right now I have a lot of disagreement with both sides of the aisle on a lot of issues, but our system of government somehow needs to be respected again. And, um, and as we introduce government philosophy to these kids, we need to introduce a respect again. And I know there's just been so much um, Devices and that's dividing our country. And we are American. Red, brown, black, white, blue, yellow, green. That's what we are. And I think that, that we have lost that sense a little bit. And I, I want, you know, for me, that's important that our kids love America. Yes, it has had terrible flaws, and we need to expose that because that's how we are going to repeat those. We have to bring that up, and it has to be reminded. And taught and um, taught correctly, uh, but I I don't know. I mean, there's just I liked the way Ohio wrote their their logic and the way that they communicated. I kind of understood that. I read right through it. Oh, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. I'm getting this. And that's good for me because I'm tired and my mom is not always easy. So I, I did appreciate that. I understand what the principal was sharing about teachers wanting if they're going to be. Um, assess and their jobs are on the line because they have to implement these standards. You know, I, I think that's for further debate. I think we have time for that. But I, I kind of agree with Brian, where I don't really want to be the person that pulls out this president or that president. Or, you know, I mean, yeah, I think Lincoln and Washington and Adams is the father of the abolition movement. You know, um, but do they know that where did Thomas Jefferson get the Declaration of Independence? Did they know that came from? It came from George Mason, who was signing the King's English Declaration for Slavery. So George Mason wrote the Declaration for Virginia. You know, do they know where did the Declaration come from? It came from George Mason, essentially. So there's just, uh, there's, I mean, but is that Preston's side or school seat side? I don't know. So, I mean, there's just a lot here. But as a parent, like I said, I mean, seventh grade. In Ohio, I like that they want to address, I, I like that at that age they want to address world history far back, you know, and I've said it many times, but I'd like to go really far back because it's, it's neat, it's an interesting thing. Oh my gosh, that would be years ago what was going on, as opposed to just more recent ages. I don't know. I hope that I communicated what I want to communicate. I don't know how to I can't this because I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
method aims is not just facts and putting them together. It's important that see some of these kind of they shape heavy toward one side, shape heavy toward the other. There's nothing really coming together in that. Uh, how that happens exactly, I'm not sure. I guess we'll be looking at uh, Massachusetts kind of overall uh, summaries. I do like if they're readable, it's kind of, oh, okay. But when you want to get into what that really means, and I think we're getting more back towards hopefully we'll do that in the last session. Uh, a couple, see, I get a little spark, a couple philosophical, maybe too far issues that really kind of annoy me looking through these. Uh, I am better at annoying me looking through the social studies books and come back all the time. Um, for instance, talk about Montesquieu and John Locke and how we got all our ideas from them. Well, John Locke got uh, ideas, a large part of the ideas, from Thomas Horker 50 years before he ever sat down to write uh, two treaties. Uh, Roger Williams and, and Thomas Horker set up separation of church and state and, and more liberty rather than the state on the union that do this and that. Locke saw that, read it. Huh, this is good stuff. And then he expanded on it and made it very in depth. But that's never mentioned. Uh, it's like, hello, you know, we should be including some important parts of US history in our US history. It didn't all come from somewhere else. Um, and, and I think what's interesting about what you're saying is that ideas that we find so precious actually developed over generations. And that we have to appreciate the longevity of. And not just that it started here, but that some people did specific things here. And the guy over in England saw them. Wow, look at this. This really applies to that. They're getting out here with them roughly all well, they're going to get home, but and wrote it all together and made something really fascinating that sparked and then spread from that point. But it grows. And I don't get that from most of the materials we look at. And why I do like when we, we've talked about getting the different contexts of uh, economics and, and history and so forth. Um, another one of those right on the Ohio on page six. Before that, there's a number of references to reasoning skills, movement, reasoning skills, a lot of kind of buzzword usage and stuff. And then we get down to historical. Thinking and skills, spatial thinking and skills, sophistication and skills, except for I think one reference. There's no mention of reason or reason in there. It's broken down to a bunch of skills as if you're going out and being able to select the first class of data and all this stuff is spreadsheet and, and here's my answer and I can find them on the test and ooh, give me an A. There, there's, it's not brought together as something you're doing or thinking of and actually reasoning. Um, it excludes the reasoning part of it. The idea originally is an inquiry into significant events and people that they should not be forgotten, that it's important for our lives here and now to know this. And when we start particularizing kind of these, oh, we can find this on a, a timeline and so forth, and I think we lose all that. Lose the meaning of it and the significance of history to you here and now. Uh, so, <laughs> take the end of curriculum framework. Not real sure, but just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. That we need to tie it together, not just uh, general contents and facts, but they got to do it. They got to do something. They got to mean something. For the students and for the teachers to be able to teach it. Um, and one part on there in the Massachusetts, I like, and then I think the uh, mention that also maybe gets a little specific, but it goes down to mention the uh, CAC, but uh, they need to know the structure of the regional states. Uh, significance of, I think there's like British independence, 
and it's going to have a couple of items. But basically, it's a general, and then a couple of bullet points that should include at least these items. And then each of the school district teachers and so forth can manipulate that and add to it the way that's convenient. It gives them some room, but also some. That's good. <laughs> that was a lot of listening. Yeah. Good. Give everybody a chance to get their thoughts out. Unfortunately, after we were on Zoom, we were not listening away. Everything else, use this right here to build upon. 
are certainly places where the content problems are really present in Massachusetts. There's a much cleaner um, content requirement that would help a lot of, you know, um, I teach too. And I know what you're saying about, you know, how do you deal with angles? And is it, you know, I think there is room for us to do both um, really well. I don't think we would be able to include all of the Massachusetts content and still include um, the processing and skill because there's not enough time. You know, I love that you reference you need time. You know, like you need time to teach well and learn well. Uh, but I think that we all really want nice, clean directives. Uh, we want to integrate so that the skills aren't hanging out there and being ignored and being not interesting. I do believe that there are very valuable content markers that kids have to have in order to understand space and time. We can't do change over time.
Those are the only times that we hear the word kids. So I feel like I can be like, you can just start this show too. Like, where's the role of kids today? Is that Tuesday? Tuesday would be Friday. Right there, Tuesday, Friday. Those would, those would be wonderful too. But I'm going to, not to be disrespectful to your no, ladies, but it's like some of us, since the last time we agreed on dates, have already set up books. Okay. Uh, I, what do you do? Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. If we can write that letter in next week, or the same word. Do you have a line here? Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, I think we should have two schools in the room together with a special one. One of our, uh, 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 our, Picking additional dates tomorrow. Uh, I will. Uh, I will not be here tomorrow. But but you can let me know. And I like like you said. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be. No, I brought it up because I think it's important that we. It's clear that that's the. I mean, there's a bunch of things already established to be set. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And I'd be able to find the talks about that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess I can, they were just mentioning that I can probably be Skyped in or something like that or, or phone conference in yeah. for those two days. So, because my, my class starts until 1230, but I live in the East right now, so I can't drive to that shit. I'm looking at January, and I was looking to do that to Tuesday option. Is that just Tuesday? Yeah. But I'm guessing most of these are rather, um, you know, like if we're on a break, we're going to break probably into the towards the end of January, so that if you have new classes this semester, you can. So there is a Tuesday, which is January 20th, or there's Tuesday, which is January 27th. My guess is for some of you that I think they're either so we're gonna be trying to do that. I think we're at a good coach now, but by the time January comes, I think we'll start to we'll we'll start on Thursday. Should we start meeting with the research question in two days? Two days. So, right. so maybe do it okay, so Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. The last, um, there's a Thursday, which would be January 22nd. Mm -hmm. Friday would be January 23rd. Or you have January 29th and January 30th. Those are the two Thursday Fridays. I can't do the 22nd or 23rd. So 29th or 30th, do you have to check your calendar for those dates? You're in January. We could. I was just thinking several of us probably teach courses or get a new set of students at semester, so I don't know how much time we needed to kind of get that going. The 15th is a Thursday and the 16th is a Friday. And then probably Monday is a holiday. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So Monday the 19th is the Monday the 15th. Okay, so. So 29th and 30th, and that is, um, that would give you a month to kind of get your semester going. It's also a couple of weeks before the February holiday. Mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, think kind of can do that with that one. What day would be